هم راح يدخلوا هنا ولا ولا كيف؟ Right, so we're live now. So I'm just going to give it a few more minutes, 10 minutes, and then we'll start.
Hi everyone, I'm just going to give it another couple of minutes to let everyone join and then we can go ahead and start in two minutes. Right, so good evening everyone and thank you for joining us today in our first session of the Mind the Bleed Purology series. So the Urology series is basically going to be running over the next about three months. So we'll be having a regular session every Thursday for the next 12 weeks and starting at 8 p.m. each week. Um, now, although it's called a Urology series, it's not exactly just for people who want to go into you know urology or people who are currently working in urology and um, the aim of our series actually is to target anyone from a medical student to a doctor to um, you know juniors nurses PAs who could deal with uh, patients in a hospital setting and um, you know might face issues related to urology that they don't necessarily feel very confident dealing with so the aim of our course at the moment is going to be trying to give you a boost in your confidence in dealing with urology situations and hopefully, um, you know, giving you that feel that you've done everything for a patient before you decide to pick up the phone and contact the urology registrar. So today's topic is going to be covering UTIs, urinary tract infections and urosepsis from a urologist's perspective. And um, we'll carry on. So if we go to the next slide. So before we start, I'd just like to give a quick message out for one of our sponsors. So this is CPD Me. They're basically um, an online portfolio platform for your professional development. They have a really nice interface, um, like a drag and drop one. So it's quite useful. You can find it on your Android or your Apple phone. So it's quite good for anyone who's registered with the GMC, with the NMC or any other healthcare professionals. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Satam Hellese. So, sorry. Hi everyone. My name is Satam Hellese. As you see, I'm smiling now, but I usually don't smile when I'm on call. So I'm a urology themed core surgical trainee here in the UK. Currently I work in Torbay Hospital and I'm interested in urology. So hopefully this lecture will be helpful for all of you. Uh, so we're gonna try this in this lecture to hopefully cover most of the uh, topics related to urinary tract infection. So basically what we're trying to aim is to help you to reach a diagnosis and to pick up the different types of uh, UTIs, what to like, what to request as investigations and how you would treat them, and also how would you follow them up. And at the end, hopefully, we're going to have like a quick case discussion and a couple of questions. <clears throat> so you're in you're in you're in infections. So. If we look at the anatomy of the urinary tract system, we can divide it into two main categories. An upper urinary tract infection, which is basically the kidney infection, or what we call a polynephritis. And we have the lower urinary tract infections, basically any infection affecting the bladder, the urethra, or the prostate. And those are cystitis, ure uh, urethritis, and prostitis. <clears throat> so a quick reminder of 
what are the, like the majority of the symptoms for someone who has a urinary tract infection, what, he will, what they will be presenting to us? So first of all, we have like a dysuria. Basically, everyone knows what's dysuria, which is like painful urination. Also, a majority of the people will have an increase in the frequency of going to the loop. So basically, they will go more often. And also, sometimes they will notice a change in the color of the urine itself. Sometimes it's, there is a blood, that's what we call hematuria. Sometimes it's just like cloudy urine. And also we'll have some other symptoms, systemical symptoms, such as fever, uh, feeling unwell, maybe having some nausea or vomiting as well. And usually those two symptoms, as we're gonna discuss later on, they usually present with pyonephritis associating also <clears throat> with another flank pain on either the side or both of the side, if it's a severe case. So when someone's who presenting to us with those symptoms, of course, we're, we're gonna go ahead and do a physical examination. And what we are expecting from this physical exam, usually it might be there is nothing asymptomatic, but in the majority of the cases we will have symptoms. And those symptoms are, some of the patient will present with what we call a cost of, uh, cost of vertebral angle tenderness, which is basically mean there's a tenderness in the flank. And that's usually a red flag for pyonephritis. Sometimes if we have a lower urinary tract infection, they can present with urethral discharge. And usually those are associated with either urethritis or sometimes prostitis as well. Uh, also, if we manage to do a dig dig digital rectal examination, and if someone is presenting with, like on the finding, there's like a prostate tenderness or maybe swelling, or it's like very, very, very painful, that may indicate that that person has a prostitutes. So lab-wise, usually we start with the basic ones, which is a urine analysis, just a single urine depth. And the urine depth can tell you a lot of things. So basically, if you have a positive for locust rays, which is like just and uh, some product in, in, in those type of UTI patient, a nitrate positive, usually those will have uh, a high suspicious uh, indication for a UTI. Also the presence of white cell, white blood cell count and uh, red blood cell count as well. The cultures in the UTI. So a positive cultures mean that we have more than 100,000 of a bacteria in the urine itself. And the most, the most common pathogen in those infections, such as cystitis, prostitis, and pyonephritis, are the number one is E. coli, number two is Staphylococcus saprophyticus, and also we have another organism, so such as the Proteus, Merbalis, and Klebsiella, they can cause uh, UTI and also the enterococcus. All of those, they might share a little bit of antibiotic uh, choice, but we're gonna, we're gonna discuss this further on with what specific antibiotic you should get. If we suspect a urethritis, uh, uh, usually it is like part of, the, uh, part of a sexually transmitted disease, we should usually think about either chlamydia or Nigeria, okay? Uh, so we're gonna start with the cystitis. So cystitis can be divided into an uncomplicated, which is simple cystitis, or we could have a complicated cystitis, which means like the patient will present with other symptoms and they're like a little bit to be more sick than just a normal, a normal UTI patient. And also some patient who present with very current cystitis. Uh, the uncomplicated cystitis, usually, the they, like the patient or the, the group of patients who will be presenting to us, usually they are healthy adult women, anyone like maybe above the age of 12. They're not pregnant. And this is very important because if it's pregnant, we need to think about other causes. They will present to our a &E or to their GP having no symptoms. Like they, you won't find any fever or nausea or vomiting, like the severe symptoms. They will have a dipstick urine will, will show that they might have some leukostrays, a positive or positive for nitrates or positive for white blood cell count. 
So the treatment here usually it's trimethoprim, prem, but for the treatment section here, I think you should follow, every one of us should follow the guidelines for our local trusts. So the trimethoprim is widely used and there's another agent which is nitrofurantoin, but usually you should follow the local guideline for your local trust when you prescribe antibiotic. Complicated cystitis means the patient will present with symptoms, but they will be have another additional symptoms. The group of patient we're thinking about complicated cystitis, any other females with comorbid medical history or conditions, pregnant ones as well. Number two, male patients, patients who have indwelling catheters or patients who are hospitalized or they may present with very severe symptoms like they're systemically unwell. The diagnosis also will be made according to the urine analysis and we're gonna have, we're gonna ask for urine culture as well. So we can isolate the pathogen who's, which is causing this problem. So we can start them with wider spectrum antibiotic. Then we'll, when we have the urine culture result, we can uh, ch change that antibiotic toward uh, the specific antigen. Also the treatment, we usually start with the fluorochloroquines because usually they have a wide spectrum. Then after we get the result of the uh, culture, we can change it according to the, uh, to the pathogen. Uh, the treatment course, usually it's between seven to 14 days, but also that depends on the patient itself. And number two, sometimes with difficult patient who is not responding early on, they might have require a furthermore course of antibiotic up to four weeks. So special things we need to be aware of when someone has a catheter in. So basically, if someone has a catheter in, in place in situ, we need to get rid of that catheter as soon as possible because it's a foreign body. There's a lot of colonization going on around it, and that will be the source of the infection. So first of all, you need to remove the catheter. If the patient is catheter dependent, then take the catheter out, take the urine culture and the urine analysis, treat the patient and put or insert a new forest catheter and make sure that patient is systemically well as well. Another common thing with the catheter itself that we have sometime different organism, which we don't usually see in, in most of the patient, which is candida. So for, if, if we have a candida in the urine, if the patient is symptomatic, then you have to treat with antifungal infection. Usually the, the choice will be fluconazole, or if they have any, uh, if they're not responding, you can go for amphotericin. But if the patient is asymptomatic, you, should, you can consider it as just a simple cystitis and don't treat it as well. But usually we treat the patient, we don't treat any blood results. And for those who usually present to us with recurrent cystitis, we need to think out of the box because if they're presenting for more than a couple of as, uh, episodes of cystitis, you need to think about maybe they have some anatomical variation or they have some anatomical abnormality. And for that, we need to run a a full checkup for those. And usually a urological referral will be uh, appropriate at this, at this stage. So the most severe case in urinary tract infection is pyonephritis, which is infection of the kidney itself. And those patients usually, like when you, when you look at them at the AE, you can easily pick them up because they are really very, very severe. They're very poorly. They will present to you not only with urinary symptoms, they will present also with constitutional symptoms. A patient will be presenting with fever, high grade fever, feeling sick, vomiting. They have severe headache. They're very, they, like they look very sick. And also most of them, if they present late, they will be very septic as well, which I mean, low blood pressure, tachycardic. And despite the age of the patient, they will look very sick. So the appropriate thing to do at this stage is to take urine, urine analysis as usual. Take, take urine also to send it for the lab for cultures and do the uh, routine bloods. So it's a clinical diagnosis most, most of the time. You don't need to require to do any imaging unless the patient is not responding to the initial treatment. And usually they require a longer course of antibiotic. And as we said, usually start with a wide spectrum antibiotic until you have a definitive pathogen, then you can switch that antibiotic according to your hospital guidelines. 
So what can go wrong with polynephritis? First of all, you can have what we call a perinephric or renal abscesses, and that's just a uh, accumulation of the pus within the kidney itself. Usually you need, they need uh, IV antibiotic, and if they're not responding, we, we will have like an ultrasound imaging or CT guided drainage for those. And sometimes if someone has a big stone in the, in the urinary tract system, that might cause what you call like a urine stasis, and that will cause an infection, and that will cause uh, multiple episodes of infection. So in a way to treat the infection, you need to treat the underlying cause itself. And that will be the removal of, the, of those stones. Also in patients with uh, who is immune compromised, such as like diabetic patient or patient on steroid, they usually present with very bad pyonephritis as well. So symptoms of prostitutes, which is another uh, common urinary tract infection. So the thing about the prostitutes, you need to think about the anatomy of the prostate. So the prostate located down down like in the perineal area. So basically the patient will be presented with the, with the perineal, perineal pain and tenderness. And also the pain and the tender, it's not typical for a urinary you know, tract infection. So usually they have in the lower abdomen and the perineum, also in the testis itself and the penis. And people also, they, were, they will tell you that they, they have a severe pain while, ejac uh, while, while ejac uh, ejaculated as well. And also they might um, see or notice some blood in it as well. Uh, and those patients usually they have like a big prostate as well. From from the history itself, you can tell that they will they will have high temperature, they will have dysuria as well. They will feel fatigue most of the time. They will have perineal pain, and the urine is crowd, uh, cloudy. And as we said early on, if uh, on the ejaculation itself, sometimes there's a blood and mixed with the semen as well. What you should do, you should do a full examination and make sure that you examine the prostate itself. And when you examine the prostate, you will notice that it's tender and the patient will be screaming from pain. So how would you do the, you will do your analysis and your culture, but also make, make sure that you try to stimulate the prostate itself and try to take a, a, a semen from the discharge because when you stimulate the prostate itself, that will be, like a fluid coming out from the from the front passage of the penis from the urethra, make sure that you send it to the lab so you can take a definitive uh, diagnosis for that pathogen. Also the treatment, you start with wide spectrum antibiotic, usually they're very, very sensitive to fluoro fluorochloroquine, but also you need to check with your local uh, trust guidelines and usually they need a long-term uh, antibiotic, long course of antibiotic, usually up to six weeks. Risk factor for those patients, uh, unprotected sexual uh, cause, dehydration sometimes, trauma. And sometimes if, if, they're not, if they're not doing a lot of ejaculation or there's sexual abstinence as well, uh, there will be like stasis and that will be a good, a good place for you to, to grow as well. The arthritis, it's, it's considered to be part of the sexual transmitted disease as well. So the major two uh, organisms that cause urethritis are the chlamydia and the neisseria, gonorrhea. Usually patient who is female, they will present a, like asymptomatic, asymptomatically without any, any symptoms, but they can present with just symptoms of UTI, which can, can be dysuria, discharge from the front passage, and they will have some pelvic inflammatory disease as well. Like they will feel not, not in themselves pelvic pain. Also, the diagnosis should be taking a urine analysis, taking their own culture just to isolate that pathogen. And you have to, to make sure that you do a pelvic exam as well. When we need to send those, uh, either a urethra or cervical discharge to the lab just to make sure that we have a, a definitive pathogen. The thing about the chlamydia, usually you, you can't pick it up from the urine culture itself. So if you don't pick it up, that should be a, like a hint to you that you need to think about chlamydia. And the new guidelines now, every, every patient is less than 25 years old, they should be screened for chlamydia because they have a lot of complication. And one of these complications is blindness as well. The treatment usually is single dose of azithromycin 
and doxycycline. But as I said, you need to double check with your local trust. In Nigeria gonorrhea, usually another, another positive for your arthritis, similar presentation to chlamydia. The treatment differs a little bit. We have a wide range of uh, treatment. You can use the cefetriaxone, you could use the ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, but also you need to make sure that you send it to the lab. And also if, if you have someone who is presented with an infection of Nigeria, uh, Nigeria, you need to treat it also for chlamydia because there's a high chance that both of them they present at the same time. So we have here like a quick case discussion. I thought it would be nice just to discuss it with, uh, with you. So basically we have a 43 year old woman who has diabetic, who is she, who she diabetic, presented to the a &E department complaining of chills, nausea and low back pain for the past two days. So basically here we can tell like, it's a female, that's number one. She has a risk factor, which is she's diabetic. So basically she's immune compromised. She came into our a &E with chills, nausea and low back pain, which is suspicious a little bit for UTI. Earlier in that week, the patient gave a history that she had also an increase in the urinary frequency and a dysuria. So she had some urinary symptoms as well. She recognized that she might have a UTI, went to her GP, prescribed time, trimethoprim for her for a couple of days. But despite the antibiotic use, she still complained of nausea and vomiting and her symptoms got worse. The past medical history for that patient, as we said, it's notable that she had multiple uh, urinary tract infection in the past. And also, there was no history of any sexual transmitted disease or any vaginal discharge. When she came in, she was really unwell. She was uncomfortable. Her vitals showed that her temperature was around 39.5. She was tachycardic with a heart rate of 105 and a blood pressure of 106, which is quite low for someone who is 43, fit and well. When we examined the patient, the patient had a dry mucous membrane, which basically means that the patient is dehydrated. She's slightly becoming more and more septic. She also started to have, uh, on examination, she had suprapubic tenderness as well. And also the most important thing that she had the right flank tenderness and right cost of vertebral angle tenderness. So from the history I just gave it to you, I think we need to think about one thing now, one severe thing, which is pyonephritis. So that should be on the top of your differential diagnosis at this moment. So we started with the basic workup for her. Basically we had taken some urine analysis. The urine analysis confirmed there's pyuria, and there's also hematuria and bacteria. We've taken some blood sa uh, urine samples as well as send it to the lab, just to ensure that we're gonna do a urine culture so we can uh, start on the right antibiotic. That patient required admission because she wasn't, she had two day course of antibiotic. We did not do anything to her. She's septic at the moment. She's in severe pain. So basically she needs an admission for IV fluids and IV antibiotic and also for pain control as, as well. On the following day, the culture showed that she had gram-negative rods. So we started here on IV antibiotic that covered the gram-negative rods. And after 72 hours of hydration IV antibiotic, the patient persisted to have, or uh, to still feeling not well and still feeling septic. So basically here at the moment here, we need to think about not only pyonephritis, we need to think about the complication of pyonephritis. And at this point, we can start asking for some images because as we said, pyonephritis is a clinical diagnosis, but if the patient is not responding to the antibiotic or to the management we're given, we need to think out of the box. So this patient had an ultra, uh, had, we changed the antibiotic for this patient and we, had, we requested a CT scan for this patient. And the CT scan showed that she had a, uh, pyonephritis complicated by a renal abscess. And as you can see, that was the, that's the ultrasound and that was the CT scan. And this patient, if she's not responding to IV antibiotics, you are required to go for a drainage. But luckily for this patient, she ended up responding very well to the antibiotic, sorry. So what we need to think about, so we need to, 
diagnose and think about any patient who present to us with a urinary tract infection or urinary symptom to think they might have a urinary tract infection. And the best thing to do is to recognize them early and to start their uh, treatment as early as possible because if they're not treated, they can develop some complication and those complications are very bad. And that case is one of those complications. And number two, uh, not everyone will respond to a certain antibiotic. That's why we need to do the urine. We need to take a urine culture to isolate that single pathogen and try to tackle that pathogen with what sensitivity. And uh, number three, uh, keep in mind that E. coli is the most common cause of those uh, UTIs. Uh, and also the other cause, there's other causes as we discussed early on. And also, don't forget about the chlamydia and the nicere, especially in any sexual active male or female. And now everyone less than 25, she needs to be screened for chlamydia. Because it's, it's very severe and can cause a lot of complication, such as pelvic inflammatory diseases and infertility. So we have here a couple of questions. Hopefully those couple of questions, they just be like to the point and hopefully they will help you guys. So what is the most common cause of your UTI in adult males? Adult males. Uh, Zakaria, do you want me like, like if there's any poll or anything or just? Uh, yeah, so uh, everyone can feel free to pop your answers in the chat box. So quite a few people saying C for Foley's catheter. So the most common cause for it's benign prostatic hyperplasia. That's the most common cause of UTI in adult males. Foley's catheter is, is a common cause, but the major cause is the benign prostatic hyperplasia because as we said, benign prostatic hyperplasia will cause what we call like an outflow obstruction for the urine, and that will make a very good uh, place for urine to, uh, to bacteria to grow on the urine. Forest catheter could be a cause, but forest catheter is the, the second most common cause after the benign prostatic hyperplasia. Other causes could be congenital causes and anatomical causes, and we need to think about those if the patient is not responding or presenting to us with, a, with a recurrent episodes of UTI. I hope that was clear for you guys. The second question, that should be a quick one, an easy one, straightforward one. The most common organism causing UTI. So I'm getting a lot of A's for this question. What should, should be the answer, yeah. So E. coli is the most common cause for UTI. And uh, that was it. I hopefully it was like to the point, precise. I didn't want to make like a long slides. I know it's quite late in the night as well. So hopefully like you get most of the things you like you you wanted to know about UTI and how you would you treat it. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Dr. Satan, for the very helpful session. Um, so before we conclude, does anyone have any questions they'd like to pop onto the chat box and we can discuss them? Okay, so it doesn't seem like there's any questions at the moment, but if you're too shy to ask a question at the moment, um, you can always feel free to send us an email um, with your question and we'll be happy to answer it. Could you, yep. Yeah. So basically most important thing is we really appreciate your feedback. So the only way that we're going to be able to work on improving our sessions and making sure that we deliver our sessions 
based on what you want to learn and the way that you want to learn it is through your feedback. So um, please go ahead and use the QR code. I'm also going to pop the feedback form um, as a link in the chat box just now. Um, and once you fill out the form, you will get your attendance certificate as well. So please go ahead and do that. Um, as I said before, if you have any questions, the email address is just below. And please uh, be sure to join us for our next session on acute urinary retention. So thank you very much. And thank I'm you, everybody. Gonna... It was a pleasure. Thank you, Zakaria, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.